I think we will formally begin. And um, <clears throat> I'm not sure what uh, people can see on their screens at this point, but it's uh, Jack Santa Barbara here on behalf of our climate declaration, welcoming you all to the fourth webinar in the Economy of Enough series. And for those of you who may be new um, in joining us this evening, the first uh, few sessions we've had, we've looked at some videos from Kate Rayworth and discussed her donut economy, as well as some of the work of Tim Jackson and his idea of prosperity without growth. Uh, and we also looked at some community development uh, approaches to uh, economic um, changes in sus sustainable local economies. And one of the, the lessons of that community development um, <clears throat> uh, webinar was to encourage people doing the sort of community development work to work with what's strong in the community rather than what's wrong. And it occurs to me that uh, what Jural is going to talk about it with us tonight is how we can work with what's strong in our treasury department, because it's done something quite outstanding in terms of introducing a well-being approach to the budgetary process, which is a uh, terrific opportunity in, in my view to uh, be able to balance the focus that we've had on uh, GDP growth and to balance it with other well-being measures from a uh, ecological and social perspective. So this evening, uh, Jeral Karagoglu, if I'm not messing that up too much, Jeral. It's beautiful, thank you. And um, what, what I've asked him to do is to focus and, and help us to understand just what has happened with, with Treasury, uh, how the well-being process came about, um, what, uh, you know, what were the origins, what, what were the hopes for it, what's its vision, and uh, where is it going? And what are its strengths and perhaps some of the weaknesses and perhaps comparing it with a few other countries, as I understand, that have adopted a similar program so that we can learn from, from others' uh, actions as well. And while there are many aspects of this that some of us may want to challenge. Uh, what I'd like to do is to encourage people to think about and, and ask questions focusing on simply understanding what we have in New Zealand at the moment. And perhaps we can save a discussion of its strengths and weaknesses or um, what we might want to do to, as, as citizens to uh, improve it. So um, I'll, <coughs> the, the, the the program for this evening is that you all will speak to us for approximately half an hour, and then we will open it up to questions and answers from the uh, participants. Mm -hmm. And you will be invited to uh, put your questions into the chat at the bottom of the Zoom screen. Hopefully you're, you're familiar with that. And uh, perhaps we'll also have some time for uh, direct questions from individuals that uh, I can I can call upon yeah. if that's okay with with Jerome. and uh, if everyone will please ensure that they're they're um, they're muted so that we don't have any interference um, that would be much appreciated so please mute your your own um, Zoom system and. At this point, I will turn it over to Gural and give him a very warm welcome. And, and uh, he's, he's actually doing this while he's on, on sabbatical, is it? So he's no, a bit, uh, uh, annual uh, leave. <laughs> annual leave. So, so he's, he's using his vacation time to speak with us. So we're, we're doubly grateful for his, uh, his presence. Gural, over to you. Thank you, Jack. Uh, kia ora, everyone. And thank you very much for... Um, inviting me to have a conversation with you. What I'll do is um, spend 30, 35 minutes to um, guide you to 
some of the major developments that are happening in this area with a specific focus on New Zealand. Um, I have quite a few slides, but I will certainly not uh, walk you in detail through the slides. I'll guide you through some of the major um, points in those slides. The slides are for reference. And often I will not be on um, presentation mode because I want to move through some of these things quite uh, quickly. In terms of the um, focus for this evening, I wanted to give you a broad background of where this whole idea has come from, from a global and New Zealand perspective. Where we are right now in New Zealand in terms of the thinking and implementation. And uh, what are the uh, possible paths forward? Because there are quite a few paths that different countries and different um, the units even within New Zealand are taking. Jonathan, yeah. we have to grind some coffee to take with us. Yeah. Right. You, just some hey, you may want to go on to mute, mate. I'm sorry. Okay. okay. Right. Sorry, sorry, Gerald. <laughs> no problem. No problem. So the first thing I want to emphasize about this new framework I use the term integrated in my top slide. It's very important. It has three components and I'll travel through this quickly because we have limited time, but we can come back to any points I make later and have a conversation. Integrated in three senses. It's multidisciplinary. Uh, it's no longer dominated by economics. Um, economics is an uh, equal partner with other um, disciplines, which is very refreshing. It's multidimensional. It recognizes the interdependence between environmental, social, cultural, economic influences on well-being. And what is critical to appreciate that it increasingly puts as much weight on the process being followed as it does on the outcomes that are being pursued. And because in inclusive processes are part of the critical ingredient of the process, uh, there's an emerging critical role of trust uh, across society that is very critical to make this work. In terms of the outline, I want to first say that um, if you want to change a policy paradigm, you need to change the conversation. And I ask the question, why do we need to change the conversation or the paradigm? Then say a few words about the well-being approach, outline the progress so far, and then talk about three complementary paths. In terms of why and why now change the conversation, um, what I do in this slide, and I will not bore you with a lot of detail, but it's only one part that's very much worth reading. That's only because it sets it in a global context. In other words, this is not a New Zealand phenomenon. And the part I'm reading is the second bullet point. And it comes from the OECD secretary, Angel Guria, and OECD is obviously um, a representative of about 34 to 37. I lost count now. I think it has gone up to 37 countries, relatively wealthy, mainly Western type countries. And he says that um, there are concerning challenges relating to poverty and related vulnerabilities, widening economic inequalities, now also affecting the middle classes rising unemployment and labor market insecurities, especially affecting the young, persistent gender divides on pay and other market outcomes, falling average life satisfaction, rising mental disorders, fewer people reporting that they have friends and family to count on in times of need, diminishing voice and influence on what governments do, and increasing concerns about climate change and biodiversity. So that's really, coming from the top bureaucrat, as it were, uh, representing uh, all the major economies, certainly the Western type economies in the world. And um, the New Zealand image of the problem he paints, and this was by the way done um, as uh, late as 2019 at a major conference, agonizing about the fact that we put too much weight on economic growth, what are we supposed to do? All these problems are still uh, in front of us. And I provide here the New Zealand image, and I can magnify maybe here. 
to just make the point that everything that Guria is talking about is present in New Zealand. So if you look at this um, slide in front of you, you'll see that uh, we have uh, mental health, suicide, homelessness, young people in employment, and just goes through the detail, uh, material hardship, children, homelessness, health outcomes, family violence, crowded housing, talks about the divide within and across society, Maori, Pacifica, and others in all these dimensions, talking about the fact that despite the fact that we focused on the economy, even that uh, the productivity growth has been abysmal for a long time. And finally, the last column identifies it's a misnamed transforming the economy. In fact, it's all about the natural environment, greenhouse, quality of waterways, biodiversity, soil erosion, waste, and so on. The point I'm making is that there's a global and New Zealand problem, and uh, that provides the why and why now um, question and answer to what we need to do, yeah, and why we need to change the conversation. The good news is the conversation has changed. We are no longer talking exclusively about economic growth. We are talking about well-being and our well-being budget 2019 has yelled about that anyway. The, um, in terms of the analytical points relating to this uh, picture I painted, there are four points that are critical to note. The first is, although the mischievous people who have tried to attack living standards framework and well-being have accused it of turning its back on income and material sources of well-being, that's absolutely not the case. The framework recognizes that economic growth, income, employment are crucial for people's well-being. But the point is they are crucial but not sufficient. People also care about many other aspects of life in addition to their income. So the people who say, well, so what? We can actually, if we make enough income, we can buy everything else people care about. Well, I have bad news for them. That's not true. Um, empirically one can show that income can buy some of these other items people care about, such as housing and maybe health and maybe education, but not everything. For example, social connections, civic engagement, good governance, clean environment. And more to the point, if you focus exclusively on income, then you may actually cause harm on other things that people care about, such as clean environment, uh, by way of example. So these are the fundamental logical analytical points underpinning the switch and the requirement to switch to a wider uh, canvas on which we need to operate public policy. So then the question comes, okay, we can see if not income alone, then what? Well, well-being comes to play. And what does it mean? Well, well-being means essentially, if you respect people's rights to live the lives they value, in other words, their human rights, then well-being is about the ability of individuals and communities to live the life they value now and in the future, hence the intergenerational aspect, provided they do not prevent others from doing the same. So the distinctive role of public policy in this context is to help people with the capabilities, opportunities to pursue the lives they value. That's the framing. That's all good. What do I do with this, given that there are 8 billion individuals on this earth? Well, I have good news again. There's a lot of empirical evidence provided by the OECD and others that show that across humanity, history, gender, ethnicity, whichever way you want to cut it, there appear to be some common ingredients to what people care about. And that's the uh, picture in front of you on the right-hand side. You see the material things people care about which is income, housing, jobs. But on the left-hand side, it also shows other things such as work-life balance, health status, social connections, environmental quality, and so on. The left-hand picture actually is a New Zealand image of that. And as you can see, it's more or less the same thing. And at the bottom of that are the ultimate sources of these things, natural capital, social capital, uh, economic capital, and human capital. So that's the... The good news is there are some commonalities across human beings, across the world, and across history, and across everything, that says that we have something to work with if, if public policy were really genuinely inclined to help people live the lives they value. 
And what Colonel Smith, one of my colleagues, has added is another very interesting twist to answer the question, where does culture come into all this? Culture in this representation uh, has been inserted in the middle and it says the link between all these capital stocks and the outcomes that we all care about has to go through a cultural lens. To give you an example, we all worry about the quality of fresh water in New Zealand. If you go to the OECD, they say problem easily solved, privatize water and people will look after it. We come to New Zealand, our iwi, our history, our culture says there's no way we will do that. So we have to find a culturally appropriate way of dealing with these issues. So culture is the link, as it were, of the sources of well-being and the outcomes that we are trying to find out. So that's another point I wanted to highlight. And of course, these relate to Maslow's hierarchy of needs and uh, uh, John Rawls's beautiful book, A Theory of Justice, Primary Goods, all the same thing. In other words, there are commonalities to what we care about. So the key policy question then is how do we maximize the chances of our citizens to have access to all these things that they care about that I've just talked about, okay? And this is where there are three policy approaches that I'm familiar with, certainly in New Zealand. One of them is the current approach, which is capitals based, as I say it. In other words, how do we invest in these things at the bottom of that diagram, the four capitals? Um, how do we capture the fact that well being is multidimensional? There's a huge amount of measurement that's going on on the ground uh, by the Treasury and others. And there's a whole range of analysts called, within teams called the analytical insights teams, very capable young people, very quantitative skills taking data from the in integrated data infrastructure, which is longitudinal as well as other administrative data, as well as from the um, Statistics New Zealand surveys to link these things and trying to understand if, for example, we invest in social housing, what kind of benefits can we generate? If we invest in um, schools, what kind of benefits do we generate? And can we compare them so we can make some decisions on where to invest our very limited funds. So that's one approach. The second takes this further and tries to create an approach which says, okay, there are multiple dimensions. Can we actually reduce it to a single dimension called subjective well being, happiness, and use that as a currency, as a way of measuring the cost versus benefits of various policy interventions? And the third one, which is complementary, is the one I'm working on. It's complementary. I'm not picking a fight. It asks a systems question. In other words, it says, if we genuinely want to increase people's chances of living better lives, what's the distinctive systemic outcomes that we need to generate for people? So those are, I call it the rights-based, human rights-based, because Amartya Sen, uh, distinguishes between a welfareist approach and a rights-based approach, and that's where the language comes from. So to give you an example of the current approach, Jack asked me to say what's going on. Well, at the Treasury and other places, there's lots of measurement. The living standards framework uh, of the four or five capitals, indicators are to around New Zealand, at the Statistics New Zealand is collecting huge range of indicators about what people care about. The social well-being agency is trying to use these to decide what kind of investments that the uh, Ministry of Social Development, the government needs to make to improve the social outcomes we are caring about. And then there's the local regional element where we call it the four well-beings approach where every region locality is now under the law is trying to generate in consultation and conversations with the communities, the kinds of things communities care about. So huge amount of measurement is going on. Um, those measures and the table I showed you earlier about problems for New Zealand then float to the surface and the government, which is a political decision in 2019 made a decision to highlight and focus on those six items on the list. One of them is mental health, another is child poverty and so on. And then it picks these, so take child poverty. 
And it says, okay, how do we measure this thing? Uh, there's income-based measure as well as material hardship kind measures. And then tries to ascertain what pro proportion of the population is poor so that we can start working with that. Here's the material hardship list. So anyone who has six or more of these things is deemed to be materially poor. And uh, that's a measurement approach. And then it sets targets, which is the policy approach. And it says here are the targets for child poverty based on those three measures. And it is accountable to parliament and the public to show whether and how it's making progress. So um, in the following slide, which is copied from the 2020 uh, budget, it shows progress relative to the target set. The problem, as some of my colleagues loudly highlighted, is that while this approach has been taken to the point of um, child poverty, the question is, how about all these other things that have been listed there? Why aren't you, as the government, who is so um, enamored with well-being as a way forward, setting transparent targets for everything that's here, mental health and others, and making yourself accountable? Why are you simply picking one and showcasing that? So that's something to keep in mind as we move forward in our conversation. So that's one. So what the uh, Social Wellbeing Agency then does is to say, should we or should we not in, um, invest in social housing? And then it says, okay, what are the benefits of investing in social housing, going back to those 12 domains that I showed about? And it produces um, um, pictures of this sort. So it says, if we invest in social housing and compare people's well being before and after that, where are the benefits? Where are the costs? So, for example, it says life satisfaction increases on average. On the other hand, interestingly enough, people feel less safe walking around because they were living in their own neighborhood. So to, to summarize, this is a whole list of consequences of investing in social housing. The question arises, if I were to generate similar pictures for 20 investment opportunities than I have, based on this sort of picture, how would I choose whether to then invest in social housing or in something else? To tell you an anecdote, I was in the Minister of Finance's office when Bill English was the Minister of Finance. And uh, I was at the Treasury. And he said, I know that you guys are working on this living standards and all that kind of stuff. Can you please answer a simple question? He says, I have only 600 million I'm making up to uh, invest. I have bits for $6 billion. How do I prioritize? He says to exaggerate, suppose I have $1. Should I invest at $1 in saving the kiwi bird from extinction or make uh, building a road in, uh, in Chicago or uh, dealing with youth suicide in Kaitai and on and on it goes. We all put our head down. He says, I knew that you guys were useless. You create these tools and toys but you cannot answer the question that I have to answer as a Minister of Finance. Because resources are limited, I have to make decisions. How do I choose? Right. Keep that in mind. So here's the, uh, forget about all this, here's the second approach which tries to answer that specific question. And it says, this is by Richard Layard, very, very famous economist and leading this work program, um, and he says, right, why don't we use happiness instead of dollars as a currency for answering the question? So I'm reading, we can begin with the problem of how to spend a given sum of money so as to deliver the best value measured not in dollars, but in units of happiness. So in case of government expenditure, we take the size of the state as given and so on and say, so the approach we recommend is to rank all possible policies that can have in mind and compare them for the extra happiness it will generate per unit of dollar spent on it. And when you say, how do I know? He says, ask the people. And it's survey-based, it's called subjective well-being. And it says, instead of using dollars as the currency, we can use happiness as the currency. And we can ask people, given a choice between 
uh, social housing and building a road, which will give them more happiness, taking into account anything and everything they want to take into account. It's not the bureaucrats role to tell them why they should care about social housing versus food versus something else. People in answering this question, which one will give you more happiness, actually do that calculation in their own mind. So we can calculate, as we saw here, extra happiness per dollar spent. And we rank all possibilities on that basis. We choose the ones that are at the top, depending on where we want to stop because we have limited budget. So how do I know this, that in aggregate, investing more in employment versus in housing gives people more or less happiness? This is where statistical analysis comes in. And a lot of regression and other analysis asks precisely that question. So we say, if we give um, people more employment, then what is the marginal benefit of that in terms of happiness? If we give them extra education, what's the marginal benefit? If we um, take people from depression to full mental health, what's the marginal benefit? And you multiply those margins with the number of people who will benefit, you get to an aggregate. You ask yourself whether this data is reliable. And it says, well, in this case, it's very highly reliable. It has been found by a lot of studies. And it goes on and says that's the basis on which you can actually make these decisions. The good news here is that now there is genuine agonizing about how to take well-being seriously and convert it into something that can be operationalized. You may feel strongly upset about the, way, the method I've described, but the good news is that at least there is an attempt to say, let's take the multidimensional aspect of well-being seriously and let's see whether we can actually do something with it. So that's Richard Layard. And um, uh, he's invited all academics and others to participate in de developing this database so we can genuinely find out what is the biggest bang for the buck to answer Bill English's question. And Richard Lear says after spending 40 years on this question, if he were asked to answer the question, he would give top priority to mental health. So that's a way. The third approach, which is the rights-based approach, a systems approach, which is what I'm working on. And as I said, I'm not picking any fights. The worst thing we can do now is to fight with each other instead of progressing this, is complementary. It asks the bigger question. It says, if we genuinely want to increase people's chances of benefiting from a, a better life as they define it, then what could be the distinctive role of public policy in that context? Um, what are the systemic outcomes that matter to people? So I will, the distinctive features are it's system-based, it's rights-based, it emphasizes process as well as outcomes, um, it emphasizes participation and inclusiveness as a process, and it emphasizes trust as a binding element. So to cut to the chase, here's the diagram picture of what I have in my mind. And the picture says, imagine a well-being garden and imagine uh, an attempt from through public policy to give people the wherewithal to live the lives they value. What are the big pillars that actually, or the posts that define the boundaries of this garden. Clearly, we need clean environment. We need material well-being. We need social cohesion because we need to live together. And we need the personal freedoms and voice in order to be creative. And all that needs to be bound by a ribbon called equity. In other words, we need all of us who need access to all these good things. So. In this context, the purpose of public policy becomes expanding the well-being garden through appropriate investments so that we can actually uh, benefit from the complementarities and relationships between these various things. Which brings me to uh, how do we prioritize in this context? Well, the first thing we do is to say what is happening to our well-being garden when you look, take a long-term view. 
I try to do that with the very minimal data I have access to. And I find that the stresses that are developing on New Zealand when you compare 2005 with 2018 are primarily in the environment, natural environment. You know, there was the red line there going in and equity, the red being below the blue. So uh, I say context dependent because you need to know what you're focusing on in order to protect and expand the well-being garden. It appears that New Zealand is still well protected in terms of its freedom, social cohesion and everything else. So uh, the question arises then, what kind of investments can we make in order to expand environmental quality and equity without doing damage to other things? This is a matter of modeling and we build economic models to do that. And that shows me that there are three or four areas that together make a huge difference. One is a leave no one behind strategy. In other words, poverty is extremely important. The second is change the composition of production and consumption towards cleaner uh, products. Third, control population growth through education and appropriate immigration policies. And four, in doing all of that, follow the right processes in terms of encouraging people to participate so we listen to that. So, how do we make sure governance-wise that these things will actually happen? It's good to run these models and say, these are the things that I came across. How do you actually, what is the governance process that will make this happen? And uh, in terms of governance, I have the following few points and then I'll shut up. Um, governance and management. What do we need to change in terms of making this actually happen? Um, the points are, first of all, we need to make sure that we have a long-term focus in policy making because we are talking about multi-generational decisions. Secondly, we want to make sure that we have inclusive decision-making mechanisms that aggregate the wisdom, expertise, and experiences of all stakeholders. We have a suitable funding infrastructure. Whatever we do, needs to take into account those dependencies I talked about between the environment, society, and the economy. And we need to make sure that whatever we do evolves as life goes on. In other words, the people of the future generations will not have the same preferences that we do. That tension is already here between car driving elderly people and cycle riding young people, for example. So these are the outputs. What what kind of governance infrastructure do we need in order to make this happen? The first point is we need to separate the long-term uh, stewardship role of parliament from the management role of, of the government. We have spent so much effort on separation of political powers, parliament legislation and so on. Um, uh, how come we don't spend as much time on the separation of political, including intergenerational responsibilities? Government plays that role. Parliament plays the stewardship and governance role. We establish an independent office for well-being reporting to parliament. We have a parliamentary governance group that's governing that group. The distinctive role of that body is to actually identify and prioritize doing all the analysis I talked about, the kinds of policies that will have multiple benefits of the sort. It's supported something like the UK What Works Wellbeing, which actually ascertains the kind of interventions that will have those multiple benefits. The investment is undertaken by an investment manager that reports to the independent office of well-being. And communities, wherever they need to be involved, are um, delegated budgets and decision rights, but very much accountable in terms of outcomes and outputs. If you think I'm hallucinating, actually, there are countries around the world, as I say in the book I've just finished, which will be hopefully published in January, February, uh, that are actually doing everything I'm talking about here. For example, in Wales, they have a, 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 a independent office or something like that for future generations. Okay. 
in the Netherlands, they have a body like the What Works Wellbeing that actually ascertains all policies on the basis of their wider impact. We actually have an infrastructure commission here, and all we need to do is to twist their heads a little bit and make sure that they prioritize the investments that come in front of them on the basis of their impact on well-being rather than simply economic growth. So the structures are there. In terms of funding, uh, this is the uh, part where the government and the private sector and local government need to work together so that everyone contributes, is jointly funded, but the government provides what uh, the lovely lady Matsukato Mariana uh, Matsukato calls patient finance, because it's the only institution that can provide long-term funding. And by the way, we have an institution already set up for that, the New Zealand Superannuation Fund. It doesn't need to be uh, investing only for superannuation. That kind of structure can be investing uh, on long-term investment projects, which have the highest return on, in terms of well-being. It also uh, gets us to think in a different way about how we think about uh, the funding versus outcomes. So the question I ask is, if we genuinely believe in giving uh, people uh, the opportunities to live the lives they value, why don't we put as much effort in investing in the children as we do in the superannuants? Why don't we create a New Zealand children's fund? And why don't we fund it through, for example, land taxes? Uh, of course, it will create an outcry, but think about it. Uh, what we're, you're trying to deal with is an intergenerational injustice issue. We are trying to increase the capabilities and opportunities of children who come from uh, poorer backgrounds to have a say. We create a fund. For every child that's born, we invest in it and they cannot access it until they are 17 or 18 and they can only use it for purposes X, Y, Z, such as education. And it's funded through a tax system, which actually is uh, effective, land taxes generate the taxes we want, is efficient in the sense that it doesn't cause distortions, is, is, is different from wealth taxes, this is a land tax. And it's also intergenerationally equitable because it transfers um, wealth from current uh, old people to future young people in the sense that the current uh, landowners pay the tax and future generations not only benefit through the investments of the fund, but also through lower property prices. So this is an example of the kind of thinking that we need to do and have a reasoned conversation without yelling at each other. So that's my... Hopefully, yeah, 30 minutes um, summary. Now I'm very happy to take questions, insults, and anything else you want to throw at me. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, Skirval. You, you've covered a lot of ground there. And uh, there's an enormous number of questions going buzzing through my head. And I'm sure that's the case for, for many of us. Um, there are a number of questions in the chat that I'll come to, but one of the things that I wanted to ask about, you know, this notion of focusing on lives that people value. And obviously that, that's an important dimension, but it's also quite complex because we, in many ways, we're not united, even though there are commonalities um, across cultures and over time, there's also quite a bit of division uh, you know, because of the inequity that uh, exists in our society. And how do we deal with that? You know, those, those very different values that people do have in their lives uh, is one part of the question. And then the other part is, how do we ensure this intergenerational perspective, which is, is clearly important, especially from a... Um, uh, an ecological sustainability perspective. Uh, I, I think you, you spoke about the um, office, uh, the independent office of uh, well-being, which, which um, I understand is not part of the New Zealand scheme, but um, exists in Wales, I think you, you said. And is, is that yeah. something that, uh, or is there a mechanism within the New Zealand system to ensure that intergenerational perspective? 
So I'll, I'll uh, throw those questions out and then uh, after your answer, we'll turn to those in the, in the chat. Uh, I'll be very quick so that we have a chance for others to participate as well, because typically these sessions, uh, one person asks one question and then the speaker goes on for five hours. And that's certainly not what I want to do. Uh, I do totally acknowledge that um, different human beings, there are eight billion of us, uh, may have very distinctive preferences and so on. But um, uh, when, if you want to do policy, if you want to do analysis, you need to uh, really focus on the most important and common elements. Otherwise, and this is a, a tragedy, because everyone is saying, oh, I'm different, my culture is different, this is different, that's different, and everyone is trying to measure and create pictures with multiple colors, we are losing the plot and not focusing on what we really, really need to do. And the point I want to make, the kind of modeling I'm talking about, which is happening around the world, is an attempt to come to the core issues and say what are the most important things we can offer to humanity at large at the minimum, as a minimum, to protect the way we want to live and to expand that garden without in any way denying that people have different preferences, but seeking the commonalities and critically in modeling the interdependency. So if you reduce poverty and you are able to do that, then it has massive implications, both for uh, the people's direct well-being, as well as their productivity as an e in the economic machinery, as well as equity, as well as social cohesion, as well as their right and voice, because poor people do not have the luxury of time uh, to choose between electric vehicles and other things. It is the, uh, in terms of intergenerational matters, my brilliant colleague, Professor Jonathan Boston, working for the with the public, actually produced that issue. I think you're just, you're just cutting out there for a moment, Gerald. Could you please repeat that? I think you cut out for a moment. Boston, Jonathan Boston has just produced a piece of work working on uh, anticipatory government uh, recommendation has not been accepted. The good news is uh, there are examples in the where people are doing it. Well, is an example. Uh, at the conference that I referred to in 2019, there were about 20 presentations with people from all around the OECD demonstrating what they are doing. If you aggregate it, everything I'm talking about in terms of what we need to do is actually being done by someone. It's that we don't have a country that pulls it all together and has the courage to do it. Over to you, please. Great, thank you. I'll, I'll go to some of the questions that are in the, um, the chat. Um, but I've just had a, a problem with my system and I was disconnected there for a moment. And the, the, many of the questions are gone. <laughs> Um, so I'm going to ask those that have submitted questions to please resubmit them. And I, I only have one here at the moment that I'll um, read from uh, Bunyong. He says, we, we always have had the funding question as a limitation. This also creates, an this, this also creates an incentive to prioritize spending. What is your opinion on mon modern monetary theory and its potential for New Zealand as a sovereign country that issues its own currency to make extra funds available to address some of the well-being challenges without having to get those funds from more taxes? So it's a question about the value of MMT. It uh, becomes emotional. Uh, whereas if one were to say that um, what is the best of... Uh, sure that uh, we use the uh, means of the private sector and the uh, means of the wider public sector, which is actually accessing uh, the funds that the private sector generates because there is no other source except for printing money uh, in order to uh, make the investment. So uh, the, the standard response to the modern monetary theory view 
although if you study it carefully, those good people understand it, is that if you keep printing money, um, and if you hit the uh, resource constraints, it will create inflation and it has all kinds of consequences that we found throughout history. So there's a political economy element in terms of, we are actually doing that right now, by the way. In essence, uh, we are printing money to fund the immediate issues raised by the COVID-19 crisis. So we actually do that. Uh, and we do, however, have the disciplines through fiscal and monetary policy to make sure that uh, we do manage the consequences of that and we control inflation and we have a control on our budget because you cannot keep printing money and uh, uh, get away with it. At the end of the day, it will create inflation problems. In the meantime, when there are very strong reasons for doing it and there are resource, um, uh, we are not at a resource constraint, which is the, uh, where we are right now, then we are essentially printing money. The government issues bonds, it goes to the market and the Reserve Bank gets it. If you actually get the Reserve Bank's balance sheet, you find that its liabilities and its uh, assets increase. And uh, essentially that's what we are doing right now. But we, one cannot deny that one philosophically or whatever, we have to choose. And we have to prioritize. So the whole agonizing is um, having shifted from income growth as a exclusive primary, maybe to fair focus of public policy, to, um, uh, to well-being expansion, then how do we actually do this uh, in a way that's sustainable? So that it's not only our own well-being, but also the well-being of future generations are protected. And my systems rights approach is uh, an entry point to that conversation, saying what's the distinctive role of government and public policy towards making that happen in a country that deeply respects that people want to live the lives they value and we have no right to impose on our values on them, provided we respect others to do the same as well. Hopefully that, that helps. Now, I, I think part of the question, as I understood it, Giral, was can we do that on an ongoing basis without uh, creating inflation? You cannot. You cannot keep printing money and not create inflation. The mon by the way, by the way, anybody who um, is willing to invest the time to study carefully what the monetary, modern monetary theory people say, they totally understand that. They say that there is an ultimate natural economic or whatever resource constraint we have to face. Their argument is not to deny that, but saying now that we have some excess resources or in countries where there are excess resources which are not being utilized, why not fund the expenditure through uh, the central bank buying the bonds issued by the government in terms of debt, in other words, creating money. What I'm saying is New Zealand is already doing it right now under the COVID response. So you cannot criticize it, it's being done, but you cannot do it on an ongoing basis because nobody has ever shown how you can do that without creating inflation. Ultimately, you hit the resource constraint. You have limited resources, natural resources, What? but okay, okay. Ah, this is very interesting. Some people say, why don't we change human beings? Why don't we create human beings who want less and less and less and are happier with less and less and less? Now, if you can do that, I am all for it. I don't know how to do it. It's not my expertise. If you can change the human nature, and actually say to people, just, just be happy and content with the minimum material. I'm not saying it's wrong. I'm saying I don't know how to change humanity because the humans I know around me everywhere appear to want more when they have the opportunity to do so. Look at all the world around us. Everyone wants better material conditions, better things better housing, better health, better whatever else, right? So um, uh, given that, 
how do we uh, create the opportunity for these people to enjoy what they want without destroying the environment and liberty and other things that surround my well-being garden? To me, that's the policy challenge. But I'm not arguing. I don't want to fight. I'm just saying I do appreciate that there's another way of doing it. Change the human being. Yeah, can I ask a question? Absolutely. Just a second, um, Marcus. There's some other other questions okay. here. Um, that have, but part of the problem I'm having, I have to explain, is that my system has crashed two or three times, and I'm losing the questions that are in chat. So I think we're going to have maybe to. Maybe people can. Uh, maybe we can try people directly asking questions yeah. and see whether it creates chaos or not. If it creates chaos, yeah. we can stop. Okay. Let, if, if, if people are willing to allow me to control the process and, and call, if people can indicate by raising their hand that they're interested in a question, I'll uh, try to get to as many as we can. Um, I know uh, Robert Howell was on the list there. So Robert, would you like to go next and uh, ask your question? Right. Can you hear me? Absolutely. Yes. I've, I've actually got two questions. The first one was, when Treasury uh, produced the four capitals, the, na the natural capital component was very uh, ill-measured. It, it was lacking in a number of measurements. Um, so my first question is, are you aware that that has been corrected or is on the way to being corrected? And while I've got you, the second question is, uh, where does the, uh, the limits to growth fit in? We, how, we, we need to be able to live within the capacity of the earth to support human life. So where under the four capitals is, is that limit um, dealt with? Right. In terms of natural capital, uh, you're absolutely right. Uh, initially, well, in all the capitals actually, there's ongoing work uh, across within the treasury and across the public sector, often in collaboration across the public sector. So for the natural capital, Ministry for the Environment, um, as well as the uh, Statistics New Zealand, Treasury are all working. There are subgroups of people who are constantly developing. Everyone knows that these uh, measures are, uh, these things are very difficult to measure. The danger I see, as long as um, that effort, which is a humongous effort, and it's going across all capitals, and it's going at the national as well as regional level now with the four capitals and so on, as long as it's complemented with thinking about policies about how to improve lives, uh, it may get us into rabbit holes where we seek more and more perfection on measuring things, but uh, in the meantime, Rome is burning around us. So that's one thing I wanted to say. But to your question, yes, they are improving it all the time. Um, they will, no, no one will be ever uh, super happy with it because um, there's ongoing fight in that area, but it's happening. In terms of the limits to growth, you're absolutely right. Sir Parta Dasgupta, who is writing this... Um, brilliant thing commissioned by the UK government and international organizations of economics of biodiversity, says um, uh, the, the key question that we need to address is how do we give people uh, employment, income, meaningful lives without destroying the environment? And he says in some cases, such as climate change, technology may help. But in biodiversity and other cases, technology will not help. That's where the population growth is a major, major pressure on the overall biodiversity and related matters. So it needs to be, again, not a si silver bullet, but a complementary set of things. But the idea that there are limits to growth in the context of a wider well-being framework is well, well captured by my well-being garden. And that's why I say only policies, that's my proposal, only policies that either keep those pillars the same or improve them should be acceptable to the infrastructure commission as long-term investment policies. Uh, we should not be talking about trade-offs when we come to that kind of systemic area. So it's very much in the, extremely so. Yeah. The good <coughs> news is recognized now. 
Yeah. Um, in, fact, in fact, sorry, I'll shut up, but it's yeah. important that in the four analytical points I made, the last one explicitly said, we also realized that putting exclusive and primary focus on economic growth is actually going to cause damage to other things we care about. And I explicitly highlighted environmental quality and, and, um, and um, biodiversity. So that's very much recognized. Yeah. Okay, there is going to be regardless of what- hey, Ro Robert, excuse, excuse me, Robert, I, I'm, you've had your two questions so there's some others oh. waiting. Um, Gray, Gray Southen, I think had uh, a question. Yes. You say that you don't know how to change people. I'll tell you that we've got a multi-billion dollar industry designed to change people's attitudes and change, designed to change their uh, consumption. And this is why we, how we get economic growth by over, by um, promoting um, over consumption. And I would suggest to you that when our Prime Minister responded to the tragedy in Christchurch, our attitudes changed overnight to migrants. Um, and this, I think this election has uh, indicated quite a substantial change in attitudes. So attitudes can change and they're changing all the times so and the governments can do that. Start a war and people's attitudes will change really substantially. Yeah, I'm, um, please don't misunderstand. What I'm saying is that's absolutely uh, the other side of the equation and we should work on both of them. And if, as I said, I'm no expert on how to change people's behavior, but if we can succeed in that, through education, various other means of doing it, and um, change the level and composition of consumption, then absolutely that would be a huge contributor. And the fact that children are running on the streets protesting ag against environmental damage probably is an indication that young people are wanting to live different lives. And so I totally respect that anything that can be done in that regard will help a lot. There's no doubt about that. But in the meantime, we need to work on both sides of it. Yeah, we if I, if I may uh, add a comment here, there, there's considerable amount of data that uh, various indices of well being change dramatically from very low levels of income to moderate levels of income. And that above those moderate levels of income, there are not additional gains in well being. So we actually have quite a bit of evidence that uh, you know the advertising industry that Gray is talking about in terms of driving consumption that in, in fact is not necessary for well-being. We already have that information. That's um, exactly right. And that's also another argument for uh, in fact uh, emphasizing that uh, to the extent that we need to improve the material well-being of anyone that we need to focus very much on the ones who are most deprived of the very basic necessities of life. And one of the arguments that could justify it e e even under the normal orthodox economics would be exactly what you said. In other words, as wealth and income increases, the marginal benefit diminishes, whereas the benefit to the poorest people is very high. And that's a, a fundamental platform for putting a lot of effort on equity in uh, talking about um, any kind of policy we talk about. You're right. Yeah. Um, next question from Mark uh, Croning. Can you unmute yourself, Mark? And yeah, thanks, Jack. Um, Gerard, um, kind of in a similar fashion to some of the, the thread at the moment, um, looking at it from a, a policy lens, like what are the barriers to um, these well-being indicators being implemented in preference to G GDP metrics? Like ultimately, that's the thing that we need to be doing here, and and sort of the the follow up question to that is sort of what can we all be doing um, beyond you know voting and so forth to um, to do this because this is obviously so so important. The answer uh, is um, politics, 
and trust. In terms of politics and, and, and misrepresentation and education, uh, I think everyone needs to understand that if you um, genuinely care about children and your grandchildren and so on, play intergenerationally, then um, having a more balanced well-being approach is the right way to go. And generations are gradually changing, but uh, these things happen across generations, not across um, uh, five or ten years. Uh, education is important. Uh, the hostility of some communities towards the well-being thing is a, mis uh, is a misreading of what's really going on. And we, we saw that, by the way, in the context of the COVID conversation. Uh, the conversation went around uh, lives versus livelihoods. Anybody who thinks long term realizes that saving lives and investing in them was the right thing to do from a long term perspective. It helped lives as well as livelihoods. And that's why it was important to fund it and carry people and do it partly by printing money to go to an earlier conversation. So power and political power and distribution of power is critically important. Over time, as young people change their minds, they put pressure, the environment changes and gradually we get there. The big question analytically is whether we have the time to move so slowly. And if not, what are our options? Uh, some of the work suggests that uh, we are running out of time uh, and therefore we need to act more urgently. And in a democracy like ours, I don't know what, how that would translate. I don't have an answer to that. Unfortunately, the system we have, which is beautiful in many respects, allows for only gradual tra transitions. So that's to me is the, is the barrier. The other one, however, which is where I refer to in my land tax versus investing for children, I think there's a credibility and trust issue. I believe, and this may be very naive, if you genuinely believe that if you pay more tax on your land that you own, either directly or through the land that is sitting under your house, higher tax, and you genuinely believe that it will be dedicated to an investment fund to build funds for children so that they're better, or in other words, divorce the children's future from their current circumstances, then a lot of people will switch and support it. But because we don't see that direct connection and we don't have trust that that will be done, there is a great resistance to doing things. And even having that conversation becomes political. There's a huge amount of evidence that shows a land tax, not a wealth tax in general, a land tax is effective in generating uh, revenue is efficient in terms of not causing lots of distortions, is equitable across generations. And if we can add to that, use that fund, just like we are doing tax fund to support New Zealand superannuation and New Zealand children's fund. And, and be transparent, be um, uh, totally transparent and accountable as to what is being done with that fund. I'm very convinced that people may change their mind. So that's my five cents worth. Uh, thank you, Gerald. By the way, the land tax example is an example of the way we need to think and have conversations. I'm not sort of pushing that single line. I'm just saying, here's an, an idea. Uh, why do we give universal basic income to our elderly and not think of a universal platform wealth and opportunity to our young, for example? Why don't we think that like that? Since we talk about New Zealand being a fair place, and we talk about intergenerational equity. Yeah, there's a question that follow up uh, to that universal basic income idea, and it's the idea of universal basic services. Totally, it's a new, a relatively new idea. Uh, it's fundamentally builds on the concept that uh, those primary goods that every human being needs to have access to needs to be the target of that particular approach. The only debate is uh, whether we need to make it universal or means tested. And the economics um, arguments uh, goes towards means testing, which uh, is okay. As long as you're hitting the right uh, targets, uh, why not? There may be implementation issues. Then uh, universal basic services is precisely aligned to 
the well-being approach, which recognizes that well-being has some key ingredients or dimensions or contributors, what John Rawls calls primary goods. So that's all internally consistent for reasonableness and uh, budgetary and other reasons, probably um, targeted means tested basic services would be a, a better way and least resistance way to proceed anyway. Yeah. Um, unfortunately, I think Marcus, I, I believe Marcus had to depart. Uh, I know he had a question. Are you still there, Marcus? I, I think not, unfortunately. Um, just looking for other other questions here. Uh, I I have a quick question. Okay, Pat, go ahead. Okay. Um, can can you give us an example of where a land tax has been implemented and how it works? Uh, I cannot give you an example of that to the best of my. Well, we we have land tax in New Zealand, of course. Uh, we pay uh, rates on our land. It's just increasing that. So we are implementing it in New Zealand. It's, yeah, it's not a... Uh, I, I think not, in, in, in uh, your paper that you uh, distributed, that I distributed to participants, you, you talked about replacing a progressive income tax with a progressive consumption tax. Yeah. Could you the, speak to uh, that? Yeah, well, uh, that's another um, element. Uh, I think, uh, uh, by the way, to the earlier question, here's a, a brilliant example where every thinking, famous, neoliberal, whatever words you want to use, economists have supported the idea that we should be switching from an income-based to an expenditure-based taxation. On the grounds of, um, of um, equity, and efficiency, especially efficiency, and possibly effectiveness, because if you tax income, especially if you tax some income and not others like capital gains, you don't tax and you tax other income, it causes humongous distortions. By the way, a land tax is a, another, uh, the other side of the taxing uh, capital gains, because uh, if you don't want to tax capital gains, then by taxing land, you're actually taxing the present discounted value of the gains that can be made on, on, on that. So it's a substitute for that. And an expenditure tax is more efficient in the sense that it causes less disincentive for producing and working um, and creating a bigger pie. And then you tax when it's spent. Of course, the point is since poorer people spend a much higher proportion of their income, then it is becoming inequitable. But you can uh, make it a progressive expenditure tax. So apply the progressivity at the expenditure versus the income level. So you can deal with the inequity issue that way, but not suffer the consequences of taxing income and its incentives, and especially taxing income in a distorted way where you don't tax capital gains on property, you tax other things. So it distorts people's decisions. So you have this inflation of property values. Mm -hmm. So for all those consequences, people have been agonizing, given that we have to collect taxes because there's no other way of paying for things through the government, then what is the least distorting and least damaging way of collecting taxes? And what's the most equitable way of doing it is the agonizing. So that's the conversation we need to have. In the tax um, uh, group uh, 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 that advised the government, these things were all canvassed, but uh, it's not being listened to to the earlier question because it's politically heavy stuff. Power is very important and its distribution is very important. And politics in that context is extremely important. So this is not only an economics issue. Yeah, very much so. I mean, we, we, we've touched on several, I guess what might be called wicked problems in the sense that they're very difficult to solve because solving an apparently obvious solution has creates other problems. Do you have any, any uh, thoughts about the, the merit of something like a citizen's assembly 
approach to try to sort out some of these uh, difficult issues? I have every respect and time for that suggestion. That's why I said one of the big things uh, in terms of dealing with wicked problems, especially uh, wicked problems have a feature called complexity. And uh, it is one thing for Richard Layard to say after 40 years of work, I've decided that the one thing that I would invest in as top priority is mental health. And quite another thing to say, what do I do with it? Uh, the, um, it's a no brainer that mental health is one of the major, major issues of our generation and the new younger generation, particularly so. Uh, simply saying in the budget, I've spent $500 million on it is the current solution to it. It's not a solution. You don't deal with mental health by simply throwing money at it. That's not how it went. It's, it's wicked. It's complex because it's all kinds of interactions of uh, kind of things. And it's in that context, process is as critical as simply saying, I care about mental health. And one of the, the wisdom that is emerging, the critical ingredient of that process is engaging, not simply consulting, absolutely engaging deeply with all stakeholders, including those with mental health, including those who look after mentally health people, and trying to ascertain what we can do and doing many experiments and trying things across our communities, and then picking what works and investing in it. Again, it comes to politics, a brilliant guy wrote a piece saying that unless the political economy changes, we cannot have this come. Imagine a minister of finance or a minister of health when asked, what are you going to do about mental health? Says, I really have no idea, but I'm going to run many experiments around the country and see what happens. They'll butcher this person. The reality is in business, we always try 20 things and one or two things succeed. Nobody tells us we are stupid. And business is relatively simple compared to the wicked problems we are talking about. So your thing about community and all that, absolutely critical ingredient. In fact, in a brilliant book that Rakuram Rajan, R-A-J-A-N, just published, The Third Pillar, uh, Turning on the Community, the third pillar being community, the first and second being government, central and market is precisely the point he is making. He says, we, we cannot deal with these issues without engaging with part, through genuine participation of communities, totally. Yeah, do you, do you see a, an opportunity for citizens assemblies in New Zealand to, to deal with some of these issues? Well, the reality is um, uh, it is happening in different ways. If you think of the uh, water pollution problems that we're having around the country and the Fanganui River legal rights and all this issue is a small, but good example of how communities have found a creative way of dealing with a wicked problem, uh, which was being uh, uh, not solved because of the power interests. And following COVID, uh, in fact, think of Queenstown. I give this always as an example. Prior to COVID, the uh, powerful vested interest, business interest, who were making many millions out of, um, out of um, tourism, international tourism, would have no bar of the issues arising in terms of social fabric, homelessness and uh, housing price rises, and environmental damage of excessive tourism growth. What happened is COVID-19 switched off that pipeline and all of a sudden, Queenstown is having a very different conversation with business people at the table saying, can we not reimagine Queenstown without, or I'm exaggerating, with much less international tourism? Can we not invest in ideas? Can we not be a place where people want to live and incubate ideas? Can we not build hospitals and universities here? So it is happening. Uh, Organically, it's happening. The role of government, central government, is to put fuel underneath that and turn the voice around, which is what's happening in the UK and other places. The local and, um, and the central government are working in a way where they turn the table. They are saying the kind of wicked problems we have are your problems, dear communities. 
you sort to that, you tell us what to do, we'll come and support and ask us what, how we can contribute, including some funding, but not all of the funding because they need to be accountable. I think that's the next 20 years in New Zealand, it will happen. Mm -hmm. But having said this, if you look at in 1847, I think it is a local government act, it talks about the communities being wiser and more informed about their own issues and they should be given more voice and play forward 200 years, we are still talking about it. Yes, indeed. Um, when you were talking about uh, in the early part of your, your, your comments and you were identifying some of the, the reasons for various countries beginning to look at well-being and looking at uh, balancing you know, GDP growth as, as such a critical measure. Um, I, I made a note of something that seemed to me to be missing. And that was an awareness of the consequences of transitioning to a renewable energy system in terms of moving away from fossil fuels and the incredible energy density that they provide. Uh, and that net energy analysis indicates that the surplus or net energy that's going to be available to society with renewables is going to be considerably less. So that even though over the last century and a bit, we've, we've experienced nothing but increasing levels of energy available, that there are many scientists now saying that we may be at an inflection point where less energy is going to be available. And this would seem to me to have pretty profound consequences for many of the things that we're talking about, indeed for our very monetary system, which is based on, on debt and, and the ability to uh, generate interest and you know, repay, repay debt. But has the issue of um, net energy analysis and energy descent coming into any of the discussions that you're aware of at these levels? Absolutely, let me first give you a strict um economics answer and then um, uh, you may want to laugh and then we move on to the wider issue. So if the picture that you're painting, if you're talking to a standard orthodox economist and you say, look, sources of energy are drying up and we'll have problems and all that, here is what he or she will say. Uh, the market will deal with it as um, uh, sources of energy diminish, say fossil fuels or whatever, or it becomes more and more costly to extract those. The cost and price of these things increase. And what happens is there is a switch in both production and consumption towards things that are substitutes for them. And if those substitutes do not are not as fossil fuel and other energy in incentive, that takes us to a better place. So that's the normal market mechanism, social effect and whatever. Well, there are several problems with that. Um, and that is very much part of the conversation. One is, uh, the amount of time it takes. The second is the degree of substitution of these things. And the third is the kind of fundamental investments that are required to support those kind of switches require patient long-term finance. And even the most orthodox economists claim that the research and development and other things that support that has to be funded and supported by central government, working with business, with scientists and so on and so forth. So they are absolutely part of the conversation. The final point, which is very important to make, another part of the conversation is the so-called just transitions. In other words, if you're going to go to Gisborne and change it from fossil fuel to some other one, uh, the argument goes, you need to work with, engage with both business and other parts of the community so they have sufficient time with appropriate support to change so that they can continue to make a living and hence the word just transitions. And there's a unit within the Ministry of Business Innovation and Employment who actually are working on just transition issues exactly in the, in the light that I'm talking about. Because in the 1980s, when we made those big reforms, we did not think of just transitions. We destroyed some communities, caused humongous pain. And so now there's a realization that if you wanna really switch from say fossil fuels to something else, it won't happen overnight. You need to manage it and share the costs, carry people with you and do it. So yes, they are very much part of the conversation. 
Yeah. Yeah, thank you for that. Uh... The frustration that arises, Jack, the frustration is uh, uh, these conversations are happening. Uh, one is the, uh, as one of your, uh, one of our guests uh, said, you know, what is the obstacle? The obstacle is politics, uh, power, concentration of power. As um, in economics, we have the concept called the collection, collective action problem. In other words, there are groups of people who have such concentrated interest and they are so small and so much resource that they can dominate the decisions as happened in Queenstown on, until the environment changed in favor of um, actually looking after the environment, right? So that's, that's the big issue. These conversations are happening, but there are lots of barriers. And even if there weren't barriers, transitioning from fossil fuel to something else takes a lot of time. And people need to realize that, in fact, this is a intergenerational game we are playing here. It won't happen in my lifetime. Yeah, I think it's it's quite important to understand that. Um, perhaps a, a, a final question is: for, first of all, I'm I'm quite quite impressed and um, encouraged by your responses to many of these questions. Uh, much more radical than perhaps some of us had anticipated and, and quite welcomed. Um, and, and perhaps the last question is, how can we as citizens or as members of various NGOs have an impact on this well-being process within the New Zealand government? What, what is our best approach and, and are there any particular suggestions that you see as weaknesses in the current system that need improvement that uh, we might give our attention to? Two quick points. Um, uh, one related to the specific question, the other is to your, um, uh, the, the word radical. In the paper and uh, in the book that I've just finished, which hopefully will be published, is um, I explicitly use the, uh, have a chapter on why do we need a radical uh, approach to public policy. And I make the point that all these things are coming together, whether it's um, a radical fundamental uncertainty that we are facing, the fact that we need to think about environmental, social and uh, uh, economic issues in an integrated way, the fact that there are wicked problems and so on. And I'm saying there are seven of them and all of them are happening together. So there is no option but to have a radical approach. So, and we are running out of time. So that's the point I want to plant. But um, in terms of how do you engage, one of the most um, encouraging uh, features of engagement I saw and I was part of marginally was the effort on the sustainable development goals. And unfortunately, again, Instead of seeing the commonalities between these different things, to my mind, living standards framework, well-being, sustainable development goals, the four capitals, the various ways our Maori and um, uh, Pacifica peoples represent the same things are all variations of a theme. Instead of trying to say my baby is more beautiful than yours and they are different, if we focus on the commonalities, then the sustainable development goals effort actually has engaged with communities, including business, by the way, in a very constructive way. And that is now in progress. So when we reported as New Zealand to under VNR voluntary national report last year, maybe it was this year, on how we are going with sustainable development goals, uh, the community NGOs wrote a people's report to accompany uh, and uh, uh, the report that the officials produced. There's a massive amount of work going on within communities to have a voice on this particular matter. The fact that children are walking on the streets, to repeat myself over half an hour ago, is again. So th th that's the way you engage. In other words, you have to uh, influence the political process. And um, because we, we value our political institutions, and uh, within that, there's a huge voice growing up. And as they do, like the current election show, that's one of, your, one of our guests uh, highlighted, people do change. And it's happening. So it's hope, fortunately will happen soon enough and quick enough. That's the big, big idea. Yeah, it really is a race, isn't it? 
It is, yeah. And the big idea is whether we have the time. And uh, clearly, when you look at these uh, nine um, big uh, uh, platforms for looking at environmental quality and all that, it goes from nine to 99. But I mean, the one that the academics conversion is about nine of them. In about two or three, we've already crossed the line. So uh, this is not a joke anymore. Yeah. Jerome, what, what what is the um, the title of your your new book that's coming out and when is it due? It's due in February. It's say the the title to be uh, it's a catchy one. It says I love you, which is the title of the paper that I uh, was circulated, and it says that <laughs> uh, 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 intergenerational policies for intergenerational well being. Because um, but there is a there is a twist. Um, and I, I don't want to waste your uh, our guest time, but I love you is something very profound because Walter Kaufman, a German philosopher, uh, said, I love you, if you really think about that, means I want you to live the life you want to live and value. And I will be as happy as you if you do, as unhappy as you as you don't. So I love you in that sense says, if you genuinely want to give people including future generations, the right to live the lives they value, and I have no idea how they want to live it, then how do you frame, implement, govern public policy? That's the sort of approach. So under that colorful title, there's quite a bit of analysis. Here. Yeah, it is indeed a colorful title. And uh, it, it really struck me when uh, I received your paper to distribute. Yeah. Well, uh, this has been a most useful session. Um, uh, I'm certainly very impressed with your experience and your knowledge and above all your wisdom in uh, dealing with these issues and I, I thank you very very much for your time and uh, not just this evening but for all of the work you're doing in this very important area. Uh, I really can't speak for everyone but I, I feel like saying we love you <laughs> so yeah, thank, thank you. you thank you very thank much. You. Again, I just wanted to say um, uh, I'm humbled and honored to be invited to talk. Uh, I don't get many of these invitations, so I'm very happy to talk about this. And I'm delighted that you gave me a platform to have a conversation. Thank you very much. Thank it's you. It's been great. Thank you very much and good night all. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you.